Good evening and welcome to the December 19th, 2016 Hillsborough Township Board of Education meeting. I'd like to call the meeting to order. In accordance with the State Sunshine Law of New Jersey, adequate notice of this meeting of the Hillsborough Township Board of Education was provided on December 15th, 2016 to the Hillsborough Beacon and the Courier News. May I have a roll call, please, Mr. Mahmoud? Surely. Ms. Bogoshevsky? Here. Ms. Santafante? Here. Mr. Cohen? Mr. Cooper? Here. Mr. Dutta? Here. Mr. Gillette? Here. Mrs. Haas? Mrs. Haley? And Mr. Kent? Here. We have a quorum. We have a quorum. Uh, let's rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all great thank you we have uh, correspondence as listed in the agenda and i'd like to now hand it over to dr schiff for the superintendent's report thank you mr kinst i'm pleased to share some wonderful news from around the district with our board and community uh, members in attendance this evening congratulations to 15 of our hillsborough high school choral members this year our chorus led by the fantastic director Ms. Juliana Lombiondi, uh, Labiondo, excuse me, had 15 students accepted to the Central Jersey Music Educator Association Regional Chorus. The following Hillsborough High School choral students were accepted into the mixed chorus. Lena Balsh, Aaron Chang, Juliana um, Citotelli, Chicatelli, Matt Colon, Juliana Cusolino, Deepti Kumar, Rebecca Letts earned, uh, Rebecca actually earned a top 10 score in the region. Brandon Lukenba also earned a top 10 score in the region. Era Mooney, Lizzie Rome, Megha Swadney, Shruti Yana Madra, and also these following uh, choral students were accepted into the treble chorus. Lira Consul, Maddie Sheehan, and Maya Wagner. This is a great accomplishment. Historically, Hillsborough High School averages only one or two acceptances for this honor. So 15 is absolutely amazing. Congratulations. And I do have to say that, that I had the pleasure of attending. I saw Mrs. Centafanti there as well. Uh, the winter concert for the orchestra, as well as all of the, uh, the uh, choral ensembles that were there. And um, it was a wonderful, wonderful night. Lots of uh, kids did a great job. It was well attended, and much of the music was, was moving. They really did a tremendous job. Also, I wanted to congratulate two young Woods Road Elementary artists whose artwork was chosen to be on exhibit at NJ Pack in Newark as part of the Art Educators of New Jersey late winter exhibit. Congratulations to third grader Luisa Escarola and fourth grader Joanna Mora on this honor. Their works will be displayed from January 14th through April. Great job, artists. That's all I have this evening. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schiff. Okay, we have uh, committee reports. Nope, okay. I reported this. out last week on both of them. That's right, education is, is not here and uh, operations we're I think working on the, we're still working on the finalizing okay so um, we'll, you may have seen some but they're not, um, they're not final. okay so we'll report out on uh, in the January the first January meeting great thank you okay now I'd like to open it up to comments from the public and the first uh, this will be for the 2017-18 uh, budget so um, we very much welcome and value input from the public there are two times during board meetings when the actually three times during board meetings when the public is invited to speak. One time is right now for the 2017-18 uh, budget. Uh, then we'll have um, for any item that is listed on tonight's action agenda or new business. And then there'll be a third uh, and last public forum towards the end of the meeting about any topic. Uh, please understand that our public forums are not structured as question and answer sessions, but rather as offered as opportunities to share your thoughts with the board. In instances where the board believes there is a misunderstanding or inaccuracy, the board president or, pre or presiding board member or superintendent will address the comment. There may be times when a member of the public makes a comment or asks a question about personnel or hiring decisions. New Jersey statutes do not permit the board to discuss personnel issues in public session. So please, before you make a comment, please state your name and address and group affiliation is appropriate. And again, first, I uh, would like to have public uh, input with regard to the 2017-18 budget. OK. 
Okay, so you none. Now I'll open it up to the floor for uh, items on the action agenda uh, or new business. Okay, seeing none, uh, we will um, continue on with the agenda. Then, as as I mentioned, we had before, Mr. Gillette. Before we go to the rest of the agenda, can I just um, I want to ask a question about something that comes previous, the correspondence. Sure. Yep. So I know we got many emails um, this past uh, several weeks, especially from Mrs. Went and uh, possibly some others, but we're, are, how are we listing emails on correspondence? Are we still doing that or are we just, if it's, a, if it's an ongoing discussion that we're listening just the first time it, it comes forward or how are we, how are we doing it? Uh, I, think, I think Mr. Gillette, we are um, listing all communications. However, uh, there has been some discussion when I guess students' names and their particulars in the emails um, I think we, as a board, don't have a policy on that, so I don't know that we've um, issued minutes with spe student-specific information on it, uh, but we have no problem issuing all the communications we've received. I believe some of the communications um, we were asked to um, not provide it publicly, and I don't know if we're allowed to do that, and that's something we got to talk to council about. No, I, I, so let me just, I was just talking about listing it as just, um, um, you know, email received. or email received without the parental details. concern. It could be any anything. Yes, we, we it could be it could be very general. I mean, do we are we obligated to do that since we are doing it for some? I mean, we have one here. All right. It's only been a week. Oh, it has been. Correct. Yeah. I I think what you're asking for, and okay. we have talked about this before, is that once you receive the email, what is the response to that? Right. We haven't done that on a. I don't think we have done that on a regular basis. We just list out the. the no, that's as what I'm, the question I'm hearing, Mr. Gillette, is in, with regard to when we report out in our, our meetings correspondence that the board receives, right. just to make sure that we're that we're capturing all communications that come into the board, and yeah. we we put in a generic description. So it could be uh, a student matter, a matter about a coach, and it, and we don't even say if it's in support of or. Right. Or against right. it's generic, but we we should at least notify that we've received it. Yeah. But then then privacy laws would then reign with yeah. regard to if there's any specifics. It's in the agenda. Yeah. yeah, but so some uh, of them. So my but my uh, second part of my question. I don't mean to believe. I know people want to go get back with their Christmas stuff later, <laughs> Dina. But um, so if but if 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 if, uh, if sort of if the board is included on email chain that might carry on for weeks and weeks and weeks, to every board meeting are we to list? Like another correspondence, another from the, the same chain, or, or is it okay to, to, to list the first one, or you can do whatever you want. I just wanted you no, to. No, no, I, I, I think I think it's fair, uh, Mr. Gillette, that we should list all the correspondence okay. and up to date, all and right. I think that should be the direction we move forward with. Uh, we'll get some clarity on how we can frame it out, but I, I believe that we're required um, to do that. And we should. That's just okay. my opinion. All right, all right. Just want to make sure that emails were. All right, thank you. That's all. Yeah. Great, thank you, Mr. Gillette. Okay, as I, as I described in uh, some previous board meetings, what, um, what I'd like to and also feedback that I've heard from different board members is that we'd like to have opportunities to talk about different issues that uh, the district faces, uh, whether it's um, specifically, specifically for our, uh, within our district or um, as, we, as a district within the state that we, that we, that we face, um, and to do so in a non-action-oriented way. So. Um, this is the first, hopefully, of many, um, where we can um, have an ability to express, uh, have discussions as a whole board, uh, particularly as we have things that come through with, with, uh, with the budget, where we've done before, we've talked about values, or with regard to um, strategic planning, so we can have um, the board speak as a whole. Um, so here's, here's our, um, our, one of our first ones, and uh, the subject is provoking data, thought-provoking data. And I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Schiff to, to tee up uh, some of the findings, and then we'll see what kind of discussion we have. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Kinst. Um, I, I sent an article to the board uh, last week. I hope you had a chance to, to see it. It actually um, talks about a study that was done out of Stanford University. And it's something that drew a great deal of, of interest of mine, and I think interest of, of others as well. As a district, we're also always looking at closing achievement gaps, whether those gaps are gender-based, whether they're between special ed and regular ed, whether they're um, students whose uh, first language may not be English, 
trying to make sure that regardless of a child's background, socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, that all students have opportunities to, um, to be high performing. And uh, this particular article, and I want to share some things with, uh, with the board and with the public on this, actually um, illustrated some of the issues on achievement gaps, particularly looking at race and ethnicity. This is an article that appeared, I believe, in April in the New York Times entitled, Money, Race, and Success, How Your School District Compares. And for the first time out of Stanford, they were, they were able to equate student achievement data across the entire country. And what they did was they plotted it on an X and a Y axis. And on the Y axis, which is the, uh, the vertical axis, it's how far either above or below grade levels, either grade levels ahead moving up or grade levels below moving down. And on the X axis, it's socioeconomic status from poor to wealthy. And they plotted over 11,000 districts throughout the entire country. And each one of these little dots represents a district. Larger dots means a larger enrollment. Smaller dots mean a smaller enrollment. And you can actually go in and you can find where your district is. Does anybody want to take a guess where Hillsborough is on this, on this map? Right about, right about here, maybe? Maybe? Further, further to the right, maybe in this area? This big dot right here? Okay, let's see. I'll type in Hillsborough. And there's a county district, Hillsborough, Florida. We actually every now and then get, get phone calls from, uh, from them. North Carolina and, and Oregon? And yeah, here's Hillsborough <laughs> Township, New Jersey. And there we're located. Right in the upper right hand corner here, on average two years above, or two grade levels, uh, above the average throughout the, uh, throughout the entire country. Now one thing that, that this particular study did is it disaggregated the data by race. Now, let me show you what, what that looks like. This next chart, and remember this is national data, it disaggregated or it split apart, teased apart, white student performance, Hispanic student performance, and black student performance. White being the pink, Hispanic being the blue, and black being the green. And what we can appreciate from this particular illustration is that there, there are consistent gaps here between how white students perform nationally versus how Hispanic and, and black students perform as well. They even did an analysis looking at students of similar socioeconomic status and tried to identify whether or not there were racial or ethnic achievement gaps from there. So it does kind of beg the question, where is New Jersey on this and where are we when we take a look at racial and ethnic achievement gaps? I want to share with you some of that data that we've gathered. This we also presented to the we presented these data to the strategic planning work groups not that long ago. So this particular chart is the analysis of the 2016 park data passing rates, which is a rate of either four or five, by race ethnicity comparing how Hillsborough did versus um, the state as a whole. So these are passing rates of all of the assessments, whether it's language arts or mathematics, across all tested grades, grade three all the way up to, in math, um, algebra two, in language arts, uh, grade 11. They're broken down, they're pairs of graphs. Our African American students by district is in red, um, by state is in blue. We disaggregated by Asian population, as well as Hispanic and as well as white. Our district is about two-thirds white, about 15% Asian, sometimes a little bit more, um, about 7% black, and about another 7% Hispanic. So what, what do we appreciate when we take a look at these data? What jumps out right away at you? We're higher than the state. 
That's correct. In every single um, ethnic or racial category, the performance of Hillsborough students are above. What else do we see? If you, if you look at the if you look at the chart on the left, I think that's the African, um, much higher. So um, if you look at the gap between um, ours and that region, it's much higher than than the state. So it's a it's a smaller gap. So the gap between our African American students and the state African American students is larger than the gap between our Asian students and the state's Asian students? Is that, is that the, the point you're making? Uh, no, the difference between them. So for example, if you look at whites, uh, the gap from whites to, uh, from blacks to white, for example, for okay. Hillsborough, that gap is smaller than you see in the state. Than you see in the state. So that means relatively, we've got better parity among, among, the, among the different categories. You're saying our achievement gaps are smaller than the state's achievement gaps? Yeah. Okay. What else do you say? Go ahead. Do you see a similar patterning, but at a different level? Where our kids of color are not performing as well as our white and Asian students? In the same way we're seeing that at the state and at the national level? Do you appreciate that based upon? the data that I'm presenting? For that, for yeah. that categorization. The, the, the only problem that I, when I was looking at this, the only problem that I uh, saw was that if you look at the blacks or Hispanic in the coastal area versus blacks and Hispanics and, and their uh, economic status in, in, in middle America, there's, there's a huge variance. And the data, when they took that, that's a bias that they never took into account. So to some extent, that this result does not really uh, you know, show the, uh, the, the, what's the, the disparity in education uh, when it comes to uh, religion, uh, I mean, the race and economic status. So that's a, that's a big problem with this whole, whole study. That's, that's what uh, you know, came out of it as I was looking at it. So you're making the argument that socioeconomics is linked? Is linked to the uh, socioeconomic status of the, the, uh, the variety of people, uh, you know, or race or um, uh, ethnicity in the coastal is quite different than the same group when it comes to middle America. Well, New, New Jersey, and, I, and I've shared this before with this group, um, has some of the highest performance in the entire country, according yes. to the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Um, at times, second only to Massachusetts also, and we are much more of an economically diverse state mm -hmm. than, and racially diverse state than Massachusetts as well. So extraordinarily high performance altogether, that, that's for sure. In fact, when you disaggregate the performance of New Jersey as a separate state, if we were a separate country, we would be performing at the, top, at the highest levels of the world. Right. So the idea, and the, the PISA study just came out a couple weeks ago, you may have read it about it. It's an international study that compares how well our students perform nationally according to international standards. Well, that's our country's average is um, frankly lackluster when we compare it to other industrialized countries. That's not the case when you disaggregate out New Jersey and you compare that. So yes, very high standards. That's for sure. That's something to feel good about. So I would and argue it actually, that. And it actually, sorry for the interruption. Sure. It actually shows up in the scatter plot that you have. So if you take the, uh, the two things as the outliers, you could see that it is directionally correct, that there is a, there is a correlation between education, race, religion, or, or ethnicity, and, and the economic status. So you see the middle portion of the graph is, is quite dense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Then, so those are the outliers in, in my mind. Well, this, this best, best fit line, which is like right in the middle here, yeah. pretty strongly correlated to socioeconomic status. I don't think anybody would, would uh, dispute that. that. Yeah. Dr. Schiff? Yep. I realize that you shared this with the board, but have you shared <coughs> this uh, data with our teachers? Are they aware of how well our district is doing? Because, I mean, that's a big thank you to them. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I typically talk about our, our performance profile at my um, opening day discussion. I also talk about the achievement gaps that, that we need to close as well. One of the things that, that's very important in a district with high performance is that we are always looking and trying to identify where we can serve our children best and never kind of rest on, on high achievement. And this is one area to take a look at, is our achievement um, similar or identical irregardless of race, irregardless of race, irregardless of gender, irregardless mm -hmm. of um, socioeconomic status? And the answer is no. We have some work to do in that area, absolutely. One of the things that, the, um, that our work groups for strategic planning is, is exploring is how early childhood education can affect some of these achievement gaps. Um, Judy and I actually attended a meeting at the Garden State Coalition of Schools where the executive director of the Ed Law Center spoke. And he was asked the question about preschools and about the research on preschools. And he shared with us um, some very important longitudinal data on preschools in New Jersey, high quality Abbott funded preschools. And they have longitudinal data that takes the kids up to grade five that is very compelling about how it, um, how it helps to improve student performance and close these achievement gaps. That, that's one area I think that, that's very important for us as we look at, uh, and remember we have this very large bucket called early childhood education that is focusing um, a lot of work and attention for our strategic plan. Now, Can I just ask a quick question? When sure. you're talking about achievement gap, you want all the red lines to be the same. Is that what we're talking about? What, what I because. hope that we can aspire to is that irregardless of the color of your skin, irregardless of your socioeconomic status, irregardless of your gender, our performance should, right. it, shouldn't be, it shouldn't be disproportionate. That it way. shouldn't just be above the state level. It should be we should have them all at the highest, the, the white level, both. in essence. Right, both. Yeah, OK. Now, I want to share with you some data that's publicly available on what's commonly called our school report card. This is the Hillsborough um, Public School school report card for our high school. This is the most recent data, which is the 14-15 data. What this shows is the graduation rate by subgroup, what we just saw before. Um, the state has a target for graduation rate at 78%. Our current graduation rate hovers about 95%, sometimes a point below, sometimes a point above. But you can see as a second indication of, of our data that um, we don't have proportionality within our graduation rate by race and ethnicity at, at this point. We also can take a look at our students with disabilities, um, which represent close to 16% of our student population, between 16 and 18% of our student population um, that has the lowest graduation rate um, uh, that, we, that we find. Our hope is that every kid can graduate from college. Now, why don't we have uh, the data on economically disadvantaged students? What do you have the data the on The state that? suppresses any data ah. where there's less than a certain amount as not to identify particular kids. So it's not us. Th this right. is something that right. the state will suppress um, uh, certain data. So, but this kind of gives you a sense of how our white students' graduation rate is relative to Hispanic, relative to, um, relative to Asian, and relative to students with disability. Do we have actual numbers, though? Because, if, because as you said, a small portion, if we have 10 kids and two don't graduate, that's a big number versus 600 kids and four don't graduate. That, that's correct. So right. do we have the numbers behind these percentages? We do, and, and I, I also want to say this. This is a four-year graduation rate. 94% doesn't mean we have a 6% dropout rate either. So I want to be clear with this. Some of our kids need a little bit more time to finish up and graduate. We have a five-year um, adjusted uh, cohort also. This is the four-year adjusted cohort. These data and how we calculate it just changed last year. So, or two years ago, so that the entire country now has the, grad, the same type of calculation um, for graduation rates. So we have students who um, we educate until 21. So um, those would not be counted in the four-year cohort, but they're not dropout rates. Our dropout rate is actually less than 1% of our students. Um, Across dropout. the board? Across the board, total. All right, so that, just to, to, to clarify, that could, that's a four-year graduation. So if somebody is five years or, or more or graduates when they're 21 yep. or later, 
you know. We have kids that move that are that move in or new to our district also that, that affects that graduation rate as well. So that's the graduation rate. Now, this is some very interesting data called post-secondary enrollment rates, which is a, a measure of persistency, how our kids are doing after they get out of school and, and whether or not they're going to a two or four year college or university. The, um, the statewide target or the statewide results is about 78.5% of all students are going to two and four year colleges and universities in the state of New Jersey. Ours is 86%. So when we take a look at that, oh, I'm sorry, 86% is our persistency rate. What this data shows is how many kids remain in college after 16 months post-graduation. That's what these data show. So we have about 15% of our kids that are not in college, um, either two or four year schools, 16 months after graduation. Now that could be transiency, they could be part-time, not full-time enrolled, there could be a variety of reasons. But I would argue that with a 95% or 94% graduation rate, an 86% um, rate of continuing in college, some of that is college dropout, that they're not going to be going to college, that they're going to be taking some time off, or they're not going to, to continue in college. That we have to ask ourselves, as we're talking about strategic planning, have we provided every opportunity that we can for students who may not be going to college or who choose not to go to college? Have we provided them with technical and career uh, opportunities in order f uh, to position them well to have a living wage job shortly after graduation. Now we do have a program called CTE, which is our vocational technical school, and this is our CTE rate. The state is 18 percent. Our district, or our high school, is the only school that we have participating in college and technical education, which is the VoTech program, is less than a percent. And that makes a lot of sense though, in my mind, because if you look at uh, the, the people who typically want to go for vocational uh, studies, they come from a different economic uh, structure. I, I, I can almost bet that if, if we have any kind of uh, research available on it, that would probably show some directionally correct path. So I'm, I'm not surprised with that. But at the same time, it's uh, you know more opportunity that we can provide would probably be better. I I would I would think so. The, can I can I ask please. a question on this? Sure. Do we have data versus like our school district doesn't have vote tech or at least in house vote tech? Is there district wide? I mean, is there obviously if the school district has vote tech, is that number above the state average or it has nothing to do with anything? I mean to take up Steve's argument, since he's not here for him. Um, if we added vote tech, would that number change? And would the other numbers change? Or it's just, we don't have the people who want it, therefore we won't have the enrollment? Or is it chicken egg, which one comes first? A very important question, Brett. I, I think a little background is probably in order too. Uh, we have a vocational technical program at the county level. Right. And, um, about 20 years ago, 40 years ago, a generation, two generations ago, there were many comprehensive high schools across the country. Um, but it's expensive programs. And high schools started to transition from comprehensive to academic high schools with county or magnet vocational technical programs. And that's what we see. And we have two different programs that are available um, at, well, there's many different types of vocational training at the VoTech program. But we either send students full-time or shared time. Shared time students go for half a day. Full-time students go for the full day. Shared time students actually graduate from Hillsborough High School. Full-time students graduate from, from VoTech. If you're a half-time student in Hillsborough, you cannot complete um, high school graduation in four years unless you take additional courses because you lose a period in transportation back and forth. So, um, so that's a disincentive for, for kids to participate as share time kids. It's also difficult for some of our kids to participate in co-curricular and athletic programs if they're share time. 
Last year, uh, Dr. Antunas and myself, Karen Banger, the principal of the high school, uh, toured the vocational technical program at, um, at the county. And we asked the question, how many full-time Votech kids do we have? Because they're off our rolls on, on their rolls. And the answer was one student. So I would challenge us to question, do we have kind of a blind spot in programs for college and technical education? Are we doing everything that we can for kids that may not wish to go to college or may not feel that college is where they want to go? And should we be considering providing more experiences for, career, for kids in the college area track? Because we do a lot for the, uh, I'm sorry, in the career track, because we do a lot for those kids in the, in the college track. And um, that's another one of those areas that we're exploring as part, of the, um, as part of the study groups. Remember, we have another bucket that's just filled with college and career um, experiences that we're working on hard. So this, this um, I guess the one student that goes there currently. Well, last that, year. Last year, is that consistent for our, for our town? Like the one student's full I think it's or? small. I don't have that data. And then the, ch the children participating in the med program. Yeah, I was going to say that's probably that that's fall? probably not categorized as a CTE. It's probably an, that's an academic program. Okay, so, so. that's more like an academic. It's not a CTE program, program okay. right? And then my other question: when we're looking at the data with the schools, the two-year schools, is that number going up? And the only reason I question that is it's could be an economic issue. It may not sure. be that it's an academic issue. It may be the families have realized that is the cheapest way they can send their children into the, the workforce without going into debt. Right. I, I just worry about how many kids are not completing college within six year period of time. So there's, um, there's data to be gathered and to be analyzed to question whether or not we're doing everything that we can to ensure that all of our children are either prepared, ready to go to college, and are successful and persistent in their college experience, or that we have um, provided them with every opportunity to have a, to position themselves to have a career that's a living wage career, not a minimum wage, you know, fast food uh, type of experience, but something that they can actually build upon, have a family, own a home, send their children to college, and, and so on, and realize the American dream. So the, those are the questions that I think bigger at the 30,000 foot view should be guiding a, a good amount of our conversation as we continue with our strategic planning um, conversation. And what's our numbers for part-time? We have about 40 part-time oh, and then so another we have a, 40 that are in the We have a significant number of part-time. Uh -huh. And it, do we know why they're doing part-time and not full-time? Do we have we ever surveyed them to figure out is it I mean, do you pay for Votech, or is it free? We do. The we district pay. pays for it. I know, but they don't pay. So it's not an economic issue. Is it a stigma issue? Is it a? Could be a variety of things. Do you have some, some ideas? Because in essence, we're telling them those 40 people are, are in essence being told they're not going to graduate in four years, so they want to take extra high school in order to do this program that may not accomplish either goal. That disincentivizes true. But let, let me just share. We have close to 2,400 kids in that school right now. About, you know, 40 kids represents less than 2%. Right. So let, let me throw it over to, to Dr. Antunas. <laughs> Some of it also has to do with the fact of um, sport, sporting events. The, we're not very close to Votech. So the time, uh, the time that they lose in transportation has a significant effect, and we have to adjust their schedule accordingly when they're with us as well. But a lot of that also has to do with athletic events and after-school activities, that they choose that as opposed to going to VOTEC. Also, there's some misconception about VOTEC in the community for parents. Parents don't believe it's a good avenue for all students. And that really is a misnomer. For so many students are very successful at VOTEC. Yeah. Does VOTEC have sports teams? Yes. They do. They have yes, some. they do. They have some. So, okay. So. They could pretend, so if they went full time, they could, they don't have to give up sports, some of them. Yeah, it's a, it's a limited selection. I mean, there's, there's fewer, there's basketball, soccer, I think baseball, softball, I yeah, think, I'm trying to think about football. Conference. Yeah, that's, yeah. I know they don't have a cross country team or a swim team <laughs> or a track team. <laughs> 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 
Um, I have another question about VovTech, which I haven't really thought about. Is their program as rigorous as ours for those who go all day there? Um, honestly, I've seen some studies that show that VovTech programs are geared more towards lower achieving. And um, there's less rigor in the curriculum. And I, you know, I don't think that's absolutely true in our Somerset County VoTech school, but I know back in the day that you were talking about where schools would have a commercial program and an academic program, it was a clear divide. And the rigorous classes were given in the academic area and the less rigorous classes were given in, in the non-academic area. So it may all be, also be a situation that people choose to go half time because ours is a more rigorous program. I don't, does the VoTech program have AP classes? Do they have uh, any kind of honors classes or advanced placement? Or is, and frankly, is most of the time of the day geared toward whatever vocation you're going for instead of English, math, science, social studies, and world languages? So that's another question. Um, and honestly, I, I personally believe that vocational education should be a county responsibility. Um, the county pays something like thirty to thirty-five thousand dollars per person, per pupil, for their program up at Somerset County, and I would think that there's a lot of room in those numbers for additional kids. And I, you know, I'm not really convinced that um, Hillsborough needs to create its own program for vocational education. I would think that our um, effort might be towards getting the county to open up the program to more kids and to create a situation, perhaps working with flexible time schedules where maybe they start their day earlier or end their day later because I'm sure we're not the only district that can't get there for a half day program. I'm sure people from Wachung and North Plainfield and uh, Warren have the same issues our kids have, not to mention Bedminster if anybody's you know, coming down the mountain. Um, so I think as far as the vocational programs go, I think, you know, honestly, the county should be dealing with that. Dr. Antunes, do you want to address, because I, I saw some nonverbal cues there as, as Mrs. Haas was talking, maybe about the, the rigor of the programs? <clears throat> um, they, I don't believe they have AP classes at, at the yeah, vocational <laughs> As far as rigor goes, though, they are held to a standard, just like, just like we are held to a standard in there, especially if they're, they're full-time. Students have to meet the graduation requirements, mm -hmm. uh, just, as, just as they would do here. But we start out with, 100, with 120. With more graduation credits than the state requires. We choose to do that, yes. Yes, we do. Yes. So, so in terms of rigor in, in the academy or in the track that students choose to take it is quite rigorous and they often leave with apprenticeships and then jobs ready to go as Dr. Schiff was talking about ready to make a living wage being able to move out of their parents basement and that sort of thing so there is a le level of rigor in those sort of job opportunities that does exist right so I, I was actually very appreciative that during the primary season for both the Democratic and Republican debates that this issue came up on um, vocational training, that we should evolve from this sense that if you're not going to college, there's something wrong with that. That there are um, many um, people that can be advantaged by learning the trades and by having experiences um, that way. We do a wonderful job preparing our kids for, for college. Um, I question whether or not we do a wonderful job for those kids who don't go to college. And there's some evidence and some data that um, at least should cause us to ask the question and to discuss and to debate it publicly, and I appreciate that. The last slide that I have for us is some data from uh, the CDC on suicides, youth suicides um, in particular. And I just want to read this for, for the board and for the public. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for college-aged youth and ages 12 through 18. More teenagers and young, and young adults die from suicide than from cancer, heart disease, AIDS, birth defects, stroke, pneumonia, influenza, and chronic lung disease combined. Each day in our nation, there, 
there's an average of over 5,200 attempts by young people in grades 7 through 12. And four out of five teens who attempt suicide have given some type of warning. I share this data because this is the, the tragic tip of a very large iceberg of student um, and youth mental <coughs> illness, disease, depression, that, um, that as a school district, uh, we must address and address in a very um, aggressive manner. And I think we do a wonderful job um, here, uh, but there continues to be more work to be done. Uh, those of you that work in the healthcare industry, we actually have um, board members who do so, can attest to that, that we are seeing an increase in the percentage of students that um, are coming to us with, um, with depression and other serious mental, um, mental challenges and, and disease. And it's important that we provide, uh, we, it's important we provide the experience for every child, regardless of their, um, of their mental condition and status, with an enjoyable, purposeful, rigorous um, experience from hopefully pre-K to, um, to senior year. And when I have the opportunity to shake their hand at graduation time, we know full well that that experience not only prepared them for the future, but that experience in and of itself was fulfilling. And um, you know, I hate to, hate to leave this with something that is, um, that's sad, but we can turn this around. And we can turn this around uh, in a way if we focus in very carefully on improving student life and making sure that the experiences uh, all the way from the youngest to, um, to the kids who are about to leave our school system is, uh, is really positive and extraordinary. And we have our third and final bucket looking at student life. And that's everything from mental health supports to activities, experiences that keep them engaged to mentoring, to all sorts of ideas that were percolated from the, um, from the groups that participated in our stakeholder meetings. So I share that with you for some additional thoughts and comments. Oh, I was gonna go back to something else, but go ahead. I'm going back to the, towards the beginning, is that okay? Yeah. All right, thank you, Dr. Schiff, first thank of you. all, for your uh, for comments and your presentation. You used a couple of words, um, opportunity, and achievement, and um, not only do I, do I think we need to pursue equality of opportunity for our students, we need to ensure quali equality of opportunity for all our students, but I'd be cautious about beginning to chase equality of achievement for our students. That's, that, that's a money pit that we'll never get out of. There, the, the, there's no, we, we don't know the causes uh, we may never know the causes. We have, I'm very uncomfortable with looking at um, uh, racial divisions. Do we look at other statistics like single family parents? Do we have uh, 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 single parent families? Do we have that statistic? Uh, that, that may be much more important than uh, economic level or, um, or, or, or race. Um, you know, in it, and uh, uh, I think some of those distinctions may be cultural and I don't, wouldn't want to get involved in that either. Uh, I think we just, if we stick to equality of opportunity, I think that's gonna be good enough for me. Thank you. Well, certainly some thought-provoking data. Hopefully we'll, we will um, continue a conversation about this and um, I, I appreciate your thoughts and hopefully the next time we'll bring up another, another uh, provocative issue for us to discuss and, and debate at the dais. Mrs. Haas. I'm sorry, I can't let that go. <laughs> Look, I think, <laughs> I think what we have to do is stop seeing kids in categories altogether and stop looking for background areas. I think every person on this board and every employee in this district, from the leadership to the teachers to the principals to everybody involved in this, even the support staff, have to deeply believe that every kid can learn. And it, they have to feel that. And there has to be like a palpable culture of success in this district, that everybody's working together to get our kids to succeed, no matter who they are, where they came from, what they were doing last year, and what they hope to be doing next year. And I think everybody, all of the adults have to get on board for that, and we just have to get it done. 
There is absolutely no biological reason why any kid in this district cannot learn. Let's do it. Let's stop talking about it and get it done. Uh, these As categories provide an excuse, and frankly, I think that's not appropriate. Amen. Amen. As, uh, as my wife, as my wife tells my kids, it's just wallpaper. What's that? It's my, as my wife tells my kids, it's just wallpaper. How people look differently. It's everybody else is, is the same on the inside. And 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 just to, to reiterate your thought, um, it's. I think it's about the individual. And I think it's about setting the expectation. If you set high expectations, the majority of people will rise to what what expectations are set before them. It's. it's it's expectations, but it's also engagement. You have to feel this stuff. I, I think one of the biggest problems we have right now in this country is indifference. And people need to remember what we're here for. We're here to get kids educated. We're here to get every kid to their fullest potential. So again, let's do it. Are you Thank you, Mrs. Boss. Are you implying that we don't do it? I'm I mean, we, we, we have achieved, we are doing what you just put out there. We are have, we not doing that? Are we not we have, educating? Are we not inspiring? Are we not achieving? We are doing it, but we still have gaps. So until those gaps are gone, well, we need to do second. additional well, is that things. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Hang on. Is that because... I'm going to get back in now. Is that... Well, I'm, I'm going to make your argument for you, Greg. Is that because we're not providing opportunities? To every student, no matter who they are? I don't know. I mean, okay. we can't force why are there kids to do something if Everybody they don't has do. the same opportunity. Why are there differences? Okay, and why? Kids are if different. A kid you have not... multiple kids. Are all your kids the same? I give all yes, my kids the same opportunity. Yes, all my kids one's are the same. Ask, one's <laughs> not. Judy has one. You're asking the wrong person that question. I mean, but my kids, they have the same opportunity. They live in the same house. We give them everything equal. Mm -hmm. One's good in math, one's not. How do I'm I sure explain that? And why is that? Game. Well, maybe they had different preschool opportunities. Maybe they had different kindergarten opportunities. Same exact maybe teacher, they had same different exact teachers. Everything. Maybe they had different <laughs> interests. But the point is, right. if the interests, opportunity is there, enough. the adults in the room need to make sure that they take full advantage of those opportunities. But you also have to let people go their own way. You can't force a kid who is artistic and wants to do drama and stuff and might not be good at math to get good at math because that's the way we need to have you all achieving. We need to, we need to give you all the opportunity rather than, the math is not your thing. If you wanna go be actor, you wanna go do music or something, let's let that person be that person. There has to still be some that's of that and not, we're producing robots that everyone comes out with the same that's not, that's not level of math, the same level of reading, the same level of goes to the same school, goes to the same everything. That's not robotic. We're talking about a kid's fullest potential. The potential could be in art, it could be in science, it could be in math, it could be in history, it could be in English, God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the bottom line is, the kid needs to get there. The kid needs to have something in their life that they feel very, very successful right. at. Are we willing to let the kid try to succeed at a higher level and not? I'm sorry. I'm Are we willing to let a kid try and succeed at a, at a higher level and not succeed? You know, like they want to do something, you know, I don't know they want to try an AP class or whatever, and they don't fit our, our rubric. Are we willing to say, give it a try, and if you fail, you fail? I think we provide a lot of higher level opportunities. We do provide I a mean, lot. I mean, we have but, um, concurrent some, college some going on in them. the school. Right, but some Okay, I mean, we have college courses being given in our high school. We have AP classes as high or higher than well, most we schools. We have but a lot I, of opportunities. But I, but if I, I don't can, think that's the problem. If I can, if I can build on what, what uh, I think Gina's the problem is some kids need to have a little bit more direction. Right. And well, I, more kids need, need more to have the opportunity teaching. to take these higher um, functioning classes. Right, that's what I, I'm asking. Ken. I, think, I think building on the, the ethos of success and driving towards that equals an opportunity to fail. Right. So I would rather have somebody stretch and not make it than be given something easier and, and, and excel at it. Right. I'm not, I mean, it's not for I, every kid. I don't mean that. I just am asking, are we willing to let a kid who is fighting for whatever they want to do, you know, they want to do well, they want to take, I don't know, an AP, I don't know, science class or whatever, an AP language class and they're not ready for it. <coughs> by, by grades, they're not ready to go on there according to what we've said as a district. 
are we willing to let them take that chance and say, yeah, okay, great, and if you don't, you go backwards, or I mean, are we willing to let them fail? Because that's, that's a learning, that's, that's learning. Yep. I, so I, I think Mrs. Santafani brings up. That gets the whole thing with great inflation. <laughs> well, I think Mrs. Santafani brings up a, a very important point are, of are there barriers um, that we put into place that makes it more difficult for all children to do well? And we have to ask those questions, you know, again and again. Um, as you can hear in this debate, this is not simple. These are not easy answers, and I would um, suggest that those that seek easy answers to complex problems are not really going to solve those problems. So, um, again, if you, unless you want to continue to, to no, discuss, just, it's I an mean, important. I agree. I think uh, I every kid has the right to succeed, and I think we try as a district to put a every public kid comment out at there. the end. That's when we can allow um, that. So, but I was just asking. I think there are times that kids might want to try, but they're either afraid to try or told they can't do it or, and I, I, all I'm asking is, is it worth letting them try? And if they fail, it's okay. Teaching them that it's really okay. Did you learn from that experience? Because it's going to happen somewhere. It's gonna happen in school or in college or somewhere. They're gonna get a grade that they don't like or a class that they can't tell, you know, they can't deal with or in a scenario they can't. So I'm just wondering, is that something we're willing to do as we're trying to educate everyone and look at everyone as an individual, not a group of people and where they fit in those categories? That's all I'm asking. Oh. That's fine. All, right. all right. Well, good start. We'll uh, continue these conversations uh, as sure. time progresses. So um, thank you very much. I appreciate um, Dr. Schiff teeing up some provocative uh, data and questions and, and the engagement from the board members. Um, to discuss it. So Tom, I think there thank was you. An Mr. Interest, Dutta. interest from there, the public to. I understand. To in in the in the in the effort of the meeting, we have a public comment at the end of the meeting. So if you could if you can hold off until then. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. That uh, here ends the non-action agenda discussion item. Now we'll move to the action agenda. Dr. Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Kins. I ask for the board's consideration of the following motions that I'm making under the area of education to approve travel and related expenses, the HIP determination um, list, ESEA accountability action plan to approve the um, science textbooks and new curriculum as recommended out of the education committee, as well as the revised math curriculum and the revised uh, world language curriculum and a new course proposal. I'd like to entertain a motion to approve items 9.1 through 9.8 of the action agenda. So moved. Okay, have a second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay, roll call please, Mr. Mahmood. Sure. Ms. Bogoshetsky? Yes. Ms. Santafante? Yes. Mr. Cooper? Yes. Mr. Dutta? Yes. Mr. Gillette? Yes. Mrs. Haas? Mrs. Haas? Mm -hmm. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> and Mr. Kent? Yes. Motion passed. Motion passes. Continue on with the action agenda. Dr. Schiff. Thank you. I ask for the board's consideration of the motions that I'm recommending under the area of human resources. Um, to approve the suspension as listed, to approve the resolution to create 2.5 instructional assistance, um, to also approve the revised uh, job descriptions for Director of Special Services and K-12 through Director of Guidance, and to approve the revised leaves of absences, the leaves of absences, contract um, changes, approve the transfer and change in assignments as listed, and approve the appointments of a guidance counselor, long-term substitute, instructional assistance, coach and co-curricular advisor, and substitutes as per the attachment, and to approve the seven period coverage, and to pre-approve extra period coverage, and the extra period coverage is as listed. I'd like to entertain a motion to approve items 10.1 through 10.12 of the action agenda. So moved. Second. 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 Any discussion? Okay, roll call please, Mr. Mahmood. Ms. Bogoshevsky? Yes. Ms. Santafante? Yes. Mr. Cooper? Yes. Mr. Dutta? Yes. Mr. Gillette? Yes. Mrs. Haas? Yes. And Mr. Kent? Yes. Motion passed. Motion passes. Continue on with the action agenda. Thank you. And finally, I ask the, for the board's consideration of the motions under the area of operations to approve monthly bills list and the um, fiscal year 2016 fiscal audit. I'd like to entertain a motion to approve items 11.1 .1 and 11.2 of the action agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? OK, 
Okay, roll call please, Mr. Mahmood. Charlie, Ms. Bogoshevsky? Yes. Ms. Santafante? Yes. Mr. Cooper? Yes. Mr. Dutta? Yes. Mr. Gillette? Yes. Mrs. Haas? Yes. And Mr. Kent? Yes. Motion passed. Motion passes, thank you. Uh, now we'll open it up back to the public for public comment. So this could be for any item. <laughs> Name and address, please. Uh, good evening. Uh, Thomas Abelli, 9 Upper Nishanik Court. Um, interesting, shall we say, on the lease. Uh, he's listening intently and learned a lot of new things. Um, I just wanted to make a point um, clear. As someone who uh, started a new job and is on my career path, I know that failure is ahead of me. Though it scares me half to death, I know failure is ahead of me. So I think that allowing children to fail, quote unquote, will actually allow them to succeed later in life. So I think it's very important to allow children to try. You know, as someone who ha also has uh, cerebral palsy, I was often told, you can't do it, you can't do it, no. Well, I wanted to try and prove them wrong. And if I failed, that's okay. But I think failure only leads to success and you learn, hopefully, from your mistakes, even though we all make mistakes all the time and we make the same over and over. But I think it's, I think it's a really good idea uh, to, to do that and to promote that within uh, the school system and within society in general. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Zabelli. Hi, I'm Jane Stats, 101 Devonshire Court. Um, I also was a teacher here in the district. Uh, I retired three years ago. And um, I, I really appreciate the report that you gave, Dr. Schiff, because um, I, I like how we're looking at, I do appreciate that it was disaggregate information, um, because if we look at the overall numbers, we look wonderful. But then when we start looking at certain categories, you know, that shows us that we do have to improve. And um, one thing that was a concern of mine was that I would have students whose parents, um, English was not their, they, they struggled with English. So I worried about our ability to communicate with them, whether by email or letter, especially with parent conferences. And the best that could happen, was I would have either the student would translate for them or a sibling. And I know my sister was a nurse, and this was maybe 15, 20 years ago, they had a way to, um, they would call up somebody and they would translate. We and, still have that. And I'm wondering if we could look into doing something like that um, or investigate technology about how we can communicate with them. So because sometimes parents can be, a, you know, a pain in the butt <laughs> for the teacher. But I, for the most part, parent involvement with their children's education is helpful for the student and for everybody. So the more we can be inviting to parents of any culture to help them overcome whatever could be a problem, um, I think would be something worth investigating. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Stats. Thank you very much. I just want to say thank you for, oh, for bringing that um, up. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Mrs. Stats. <laughs> yes. Because I work in the emergency room, and we deal with or all sorts of different languages. And um, I, too, sometimes use siblings or something. I mean, I, I speak a little Spanish and a little other languages. But I feel that um, even when you have someone to translate, they might not actually um, get the depth of what you're really saying. And um, I think it's really important that they get the, the meaning and the helpfulness that we are trying to provide them and basically the understanding <clears throat> of, what we, of what we want and how to help them. And also, um, if the student them, himself were translating, they might not give the bad the news. Whole truth. <laughs> <laughs> or even their sibling. Right, right. I agree. Thank you. Henry Goodhue, Hillsborough Education Association, as well as Laurel Drive. Um, I just want to say I appreciate the board's interest in fostering the individual success of each student. Um, 
and sincerely hope that we can continue on that path. I just find it ironic that minutes after that we approve the ESEA accountability plan where we will ostensibly take steps to find ways to have 95% of our students conform to taking a mandated test that is statistically flawed and has been proven not to work. Um, so I think that there's two different stories here and if we continue to subscribe blindly to things of SGPs, SGOs, AYP, all of the, the myriad of alphabet soup that really just boils down to have we gone from one part to a next on the numbers and we're right to celebrate that success. Um, but I just find it that these are somewhat counter in what we're talking about, that we can't expect everyone or 95% of our students to sit to achieve a certain score, to do certain things, when the message is also, yes, but you have to do it in a standardized way and you have to do it in this year at that time or possibly you may not graduate high school or possibly a teacher's evaluation could change from that. Because I can assure you that our staff is here every single day believing in the potential of every single student in every single seat in their classroom but they're shackled by unfunded mandates, by you know, all the different things that impede their ability to find those unique times to allow those students to foster resiliency and to make those, those introspective leaps into the things that they, they truly would like to learn. Um, so I ask that the board take that into consideration as they continue these conversations and thank them for doing so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. So um, let's start off with a little simple question. What are some things that make a person leave from a restaurant? Is it bad food, mean, weeder, ma mean waiters or waitresses, darkly lit lighting systems? Sure, all these may contribute to it, but imagine walking into a restaurant with a distinguishing feature, a smell of a garbage can or something along the sorts. Believe it or not, smell is a key feature when someone is deciding to leave a restaurant. Who would want to eat in a dump? <clears throat> In fact, Rebecca McClanahan, a renowned author, claims that of the five senses, smell is the best one with the memory. Thus, we must do everything we can to keep ourselves and our property smelling nice. Now, this abstract concept doesn't just apply to restaurants, as in our analogy, but also to our school bathrooms and locker rooms. <laughs> so, today, Jeff and I, Varun, we will be representing the HHS freshman class of 2020. I'm the class president, and here's the class treasurer who will now give you the logistics. <laughs> so, as Varun said, bathrooms need air fresheners. Many have tried before, and I understand that they have failed in reasons such as allergies, price, efficiency, and misuse. To address all these issues tonight, I give you the Maso air freshening bag. Efficient, cost-friendly, and environment healthy, just some adjectives to describe this bag. The Maso air freshener, also the Maso natural air purifying bag, is the easiest way to maintain a fresh, dry, and odor-free environment. Without using batteries or wires, the Maso bag will work continuously to remove odors, allergens, and harmful pollutants from the nearby environment. In damp, musty environments, the Maso bag will absorb excess moisture to prevent mold, mildew, and bacteria from forming. The Maso bag is filled with non-toxic, chemical, and fragrance-free Maso bamboo charcoal that allows students to breathe safely. Now, you may ask, what is this? bamboo charcoal? Well, it's commonly referred to as the black diamond in Asia, and what it is, it's a bamboo grown in Asia, and it has little tiny pores in it. Think of it as a giant sponge that air can pass through, however, bacteria, odors, and stuff like that cannot fit through. With simple maintenance, these muscle bags can be reused up to two years. Just once a month, place the bag outside for about 24 hours, and the UV rays from the sun will come in and push all the bacteria out, making it ready to use again. So you may be asking in the back of your head, why is this freshman up here talking to me? Well, I'm here to talk to you, one, because we got slapped in the face with a big no by grounds. Also, because as a freshman, it's believed at HHS that we have to learn our way around the ropes before we can cast our opinion. I disagree <laughs> with that. I believe that I want to make these four years as best as possible, and I'm not going to let Gray interfere with that. Yeah, you know, when you think of like an air freshener, you think of one of those things that squirts out that good air, but this is not like that. This is like an allergy-free uh, option. And as Jeff explained, it's a bag that absorbs the bad odors. So 
Thanks, Jeff. At the middle school, our student council has done a ton of great things. Now, at the high school, we also want to continue over these things that we have been doing. The great thing about something like this is it not only applies to the freshmen, not even applies only to the students, but to the whole school. Trust me when I say that my teachers love the idea as well. Even faculty bathrooms. Exactly. <laughs> we have talked to faculty members of the school as well, but we decided that it would be better to bring it up to the board as well, just in case. So everybody thinks that we freshmen are a little bit more scared to do things, but this is surely not how the class of 2020 is. We are not afraid to make change. So we ask for your help in removing the odor from the bathrooms and replacing it from something where the students can be comfortable in. Now, let me end it with a corny joke. It's something I like to do and I've done in the middle school and the high school throughout all my speeches. What did the Fresh Prince call his air cleaner? Anybody know? No. The Bel Air Freshener. Uh. Ah. <laughs> so anyways, thank you for your time, and we need to seriously consider keeping the bathrooms and locker rooms in good smell as requested by many students. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for your advocacy. Just to clarify, student council will be able to fund all of this. We are not asking for a sponsor for this. We just want your permission, and we want you to endorse it. Do you have okay. it? Thank you very much. Do you have the product? Uh. We have, we have an image, we have a site, we have what's we, in it. We can show you the lot. No, but I mean, this is something that you produce or you, you know yeah. where to get. Like if we yeah. said, you can order. go for it. This is not your product that you designed. This is a product you're bringing in? No, yeah. Yep. Okay. okay. I, I think Thanks. a good next step is for you to email Mr. Mahmood, our business administrator, who will pass it along to our <laughs> director of billings and grants so we can continue on. Like wonderful, that. wonderful speech. <laughs> Thank you. 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 So that he doesn't have to use the bathroom. <laughs> so I definitely <laughs> approve that this is a great thought. <laughs> I'm here uh, for uh, another reason, and I think that discussion which we were having was uh, whether a kid should be given a second chance, and are we giving them? So I have two kids. One of them is in sixth grade, and this year <laughs> he did not get into the honors program. And he was very disappointed because he has an older brother who is a sophomore and <clears throat> he's uh, taking AP Calc this year. So it was like when the older one heard the news that he did not get into honors, he said, oh, you know what that means? That means you will be always a level be below me. <laughs> so he was very disturbed and uh, he said, I have to work towards it. And I, I see that kid working like one and a half hours every day on his math. And it's not a push from the parents, it's not a push from the brother, but it's self-motivation because he saw that, you know. So I was thinking over it and I thought maybe the district would give such kids another chance because as I understand the school system, it's going to be like he'll not be able to take algebra one in seventh grade and so on. So that means he will be definitely a level lower. <clears throat> so I was uh, to bring up this ch uh, question that why are the kids not given a second chance to qualify for the Iowa test, which is I think Iowa algebra test. I mean, there, there might be some kids and not only my kid, but even the other kids, right? They should be given a second chance. So. Hey, Dr. Antunes, if you'd like to just describe the process. <laughs> Surely. So you clearly are familiar with the process since you've, spoke, you've spoken of the rubric and the criteria. There's criteria used for honors starting at fifth grade level. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend that you reach out to the content area supervisor, discuss the situation with him or her, and he or she may be able to spread some light on the issue. I don't know your particular child's okay. situation. However, we do have criteria, and the expectation is that students meet the criteria. It is not one criteria. They're typically multiple measures, so that if a student doesn't do well on one test, that ought not 
mean that he, she or she won't get in. It's just, it's, it's one measure that's utilized. So that's typically what I would recommend that you do. So I mean, when I make- There is a process though, and it is not an arbitrary and capricious process. It is, it is applied consistently and fairly across the board. Right, right, I understand. But what I'm saying is that it's all decided at fifth grade level, right? I mean, the kids, when they are in fifth grade, they are evaluated and the decision is made. But what I'm saying is, so Iowa is being tested in sixth grade. So what if in midterm the kid has worked towards it right before Iowa? Do you have any other uh, way the kid can try? What I can tell you is that typically we don't make those movements in the middle of the year. However, if a student does not meet the requirement in fifth grade, he or she always has another opportunity. Each grade provides another opportunity. You're not set on a track that you're never allowed to go somewhere else. That's not the case. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you for you. expressing it. Can I? We have sixth grade honors? Well, advanced math. Advanced math. It's just math. And, and math. Yeah, so there, it's, it's an advanced. It's not called honors. Okay. It's just a. It's pull out math. math. It's, like, it's advanced. Okay. It's advanced math. Advanced math. Is it I didn't know my kid was testing. No, not a problem. Hal Brown, Stonewick Drive. Uh, hopefully I'm not beating a dead horse here, but I had some questions going back to the artificial turf. Uh, the cost of it, bottom line, I'm... Yeah, I think, Mr. Brown, I, I know that we were scheduled to meet this morning. I do apologize. No, I, no uh, problem. I was not able to meet. But um, some of the questions you asked, I wasn't in the office, so I couldn't um, get some of the answers. But I do have some of the questions that I probably have some of the answers to. Um, and then maybe for our next meeting, we can get you all the, the, uh, the answers to the questions. So I know Teresa sent me a list of stuff today that you went over with her. Some of the stuff I have, some unfortunately I do not. But I'll try my best to answer as many as I can. If the board will forgive me for doing a quick Q&A with the business administrator, I know you. I mean, so, yeah. so the request came out this morning? Yeah, uh, we, okay. I was scheduled to meet with Mr. Brown. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get to work today, so um, she, Teresa had taken some of the information. Okay. I wasn't able to get all the answers, but some I have, some I don't. Okay. If you want to list the questions, and then... Well, for it, what it's worth, Iman's been extremely cooperative in trying to provide me with answers, and I applaud him for the transparency. So okay. it's, you know, there's no problems. It's, I was, what I wanted to know was what the cost was. I mean, it went out to public bid, mm -hmm. and uh, I th thought it went out at 389, or that was the accepted bid. Okay. Um, why don't we do this? Why don't you give the questions? Because I think it's, I think it's worthwhile that we share it with the public. Okay. So, no problem. Um, so. Total cost. The total cost and what it actually cost after bond attorneys, architects fees, okay. uh, the professional people yes. involved in it. Uh, the cost of the change orders okay. and what the problem was, what needed to be changed. You had a f the prior field outlasted all expectations. Mm -hmm. so. What was wrong that you had change orders? I realize you dig it up and it's 10 years of pipes underground and what have you, but if it had to be re-landscaped, what was wrong when they did it 10 years ago? Yeah, the goal post, I know the goalpost is one of them, was one of the issues. Okay, so total cost, cost of the different, uh, breakdown of the different fees? Yeah, uh, I, had, I had heard and change land, orders. land tech has a reputation, I guess, for quite a few change orders. And I was wondering if the fee that the architect was charging us, is that a set fee? Or if, in other words, do they get a percentage of the total cost of the project? Okay, he'll, he'll have that information. He'll, he can communicate that you um, directly, but then also he can report it out um, either to the operations meeting. committee or at the next board meeting. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't mind a report from the turf committee from the board, whoever, okay. you know, addressing the, the, whole, the whole project from start to finish. He's on it. Um, last week, uh, I asked about uh, 
much to Steve's chagrin about insurance policy on the field. I don't know if there was, I think that was part of the bid process that the field is insured in case field turf goes under. The, um, Mr. Brown, yeah, we, when you say bid process, the manufacturers um, does have an insurance policy that they, we do have a warranty with field turf, so that exists for the board. Uh, that, that question I was able to get um, some answers on. I think you had asked about our insurance policy itself, which we did get an answer. So our insurance policy is for, um, we have a property insurance policy. So God forbid the student gets hurt or anything happens. If the turf field is ripped, we have insurance to cover that. Um, as far as like the turf field being defective, uh, our policy, our broker uh, said that that's done uh, case by case. So our insurance broker would not commit uh, other than the fact that we do have a policy for property. Um, we also have warranties that were provided uh, by Field Turf. Uh, the insurance broker also told us, I didn't know this, that um, a lot of times these type of companies also insure their warranties. So <coughs> there could be a possibility that Field Turf, I don't know this to be factual, that Field Turf may have an insure, uh, may have a warranty, but that warranty is insured. I just don't have that definitively yet. I have yes. heard in the in the industry that it's common for a customer, the board, to have it written into the specs that the supplier takes out a policy so that if they did indeed go bankrupt, we're covered. And I'd like to know if such a policy was taken out to protect the taxpayers of Hillsborough. Uh, I'll, check, I, he'll check the bid spec for that. I also wanted to know uh, how many days they were working on the project, how many days the architect was there. I believe the architect was the construction manager. Yep. How many man hours did they put in and what did that <laughs> hourly rate translate to? Uh, that's about it. Like I say, if the board wants to prepare a, a more uh, inclusive uh, report, there's probably a lot of things I didn't touch on. That He'll include that. So everything you have and if there's additional information. All right. By the way, Tom, the flag is up at the high school in the dark. There's no light on it. No We'll, we'll take a look at it. Um, we thought we addressed that, but we'll take a look at it. Yeah, I informed our, our BA last week when you notified us. So. I'm sure Ryman will be out there with a flashlight to make sure it's <laughs> I would have no problem with long. that, Mr. Brown. I have no uh, problem with that. <laughs> and by the way, Dr. Schiff, to your credit, I think I had read a couple of years ago, you said about 50% of the kids from Hillsboro that go to RVCC are taking remedial courses? In mathematics, it was, uh, it was actually closer to 60% of the students about three or four years ago were taking um, remedial courses uh, to get in. And that represented approximately 15 or so percent of our total student body. So it was, um, it was something that generated a great deal of focus and attention on preparation for college level math. We developed a new course at the high school, a double period algebra one, which has uh, worked very, very well for those children. And, um, uh, but we're still looking at that. I mean, that these, these are issues that, that don't go away overnight. Uh, but, um, uh, but although it's a large percent of the children that do go, to um, RVCC, it represents a, a relatively small amount of the total student body, but you're actually making my point again about are, are there opportunities that we're missing for students that, um, that may have interests other places other than college that, uh, that we're not providing for them. And that may be actually a, a leading indicator of that very issue. Because I, I had heard those kind of numbers 10, 15 years ago. I mean, I'm just wondering if there's been any movement to the better, or it's getting worse. Yeah, there, th this has actually been a state initiative. There, there are, um, up in Essex County, the number of, of freshmen that have to take remedial courses in mathematics 
and it seems to be specific to math, not, not language, is closer to 90%. So, I mean, very, very high remedial rates um, up there. We actually have at RVCC um, some of the lowest rates of having to repeat um, relative to other community colleges throughout the state, but it's absolutely an issue, absolutely. How do we compare in, say, how many, I assume Rutgers offers remedial courses of kids that, that go to the state university? That data we don't have. So we, we have RVCC data for the past few years uh, because we have a partnership with RVCC, and we don't have as many students going. RVCC takes the most um, students from our graduating class typically every year, and we have had either the first or second highest enrollment from a public high school in RV, to RVCC in terms of numbers of students uh, in the, in, well, anywhere in the entire Somerset County as well as Hunterdon County that sends to RVCC as well. So it's an important partnership that we have with them. We do concurrent enrollment work with them. Um, we study students that, that exit from here and continue on to RVCC. Also, how do we, I saw the positive numbers compared statewide, but how do we compare with, they still Civil using the uh, various letters for socioeconomic? Yeah, the, uh, the district factor groups? Yeah, they're, that's still in existence? Um, yes, we typically do slightly better in some areas, slightly lower, um, but relatively similar to other very high performing suburban districts in, in New Jersey. How do we compare, say, Bridgewater, Montgomery? Montgomery is not in our district factor group. They're actually in a higher district factor okay. group. But um, uh, Bridgewater Bernards is also in the same district factor group, J, as, uh, as Montgomery. But we, we perform as well as um, other I district factor group districts, which is the second highest socioeconomic um, category in the state of New Jersey, J being the highest. Okay, thank you, sir. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no other public comment, any announcements or any from the board? Does everyone have a nice holiday? Oh, sorry. Hi. Just one last question. Uh, do we have the statistics about the placement of the uh, high school seniors in the colleges? There's a great deal of, of data that comes out of the, um, that's actually on our state report card, uh, as well as um, our guidance director. So uh, if you, you know, if you ask us specific, we can um, track it down for you. I don't have those figures at, at my okay. fingertips right now. I can okay. give you some generalization. We send our kids to some of the finest colleges and universities in the entire country, um, but our largest uh, population of students go to RVCC. And as Mrs. Santafante indicated, um, some of those students are going for um, reasons other than academic achievement, that they have gotten into other um, four-year colleges and universities that may want to stay home, live at home. There may be financial um, reasons for, for that. Uh, and RVCC is a, is a very good um, uh, college that you can get an associate's degree in, and, uh, uh, and other certifications from. No, I, I just thought it would be even motivating to see because I know certain of uh, certain kids they made it to the Ivy League colleges. So if that data is available, it's motivating for the other kids too in the district, right? Yeah. Yeah. Just because I have a high schooler, and some many of us have students in high school, um, every child will get access to Naviance, which in Naviance shows you where your student is performing compared to other students from Hillsborough and schools that they've gone to. It won't hit every school, depending on the number of students that have applied in the data, but it gives you an idea of where your student is compared to other students from Hillsborough at different right. colleges. You know, these kids, they were just looking around, and I know this year, uh, some senior, she made it to she Princeton, some made it to Harvard, yeah. So they were just trying to figure out where they stand with those kids. Like, you know, they were just kind of comparing. So I was thinking that's just through word of mouth they came to know the placement. So if there is something, you know, where the kids can uh, look and find out. They, so. they will get access to Navion, so that will help them look if that's what they're... Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Board oh, we're members. We're doing public. We're doing a, a, a yeah. meeting. All right. So um, I was under the weather last week, so I missed the meeting, so I didn't get to publicly uh, oh, give you. tribute to Dev uh, for his uh, three years of service. Um, Dev, uh, you were... Pleasure to work with on the board. I, or, uh, I appreciate your work, especially um, negotiations committee this last time around. 
I don't know the long nights we put in. Uh, you did a great job, and I wish you continued success, and I know you will be successful. Thank Everything, you. and uh, just thank you. Thank you. Thank you to All right, Devin. and um, this is our Happy last meeting of the year, so uh, I <laughs> just want to wish everybody a, um, a restful break. Um, Merry Christmas to those who practice, believe, and celebrate that. Happy Hanukkah and Happy New Year, and we'll be uh, back on the 9th for a reorganization meeting. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I'd like to take a motion to adjourn. <laughs> so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We're adjourned. Thank you. See you.